Most children remember their first interaction with paint, crayons, and scissors, but there's always that one child whose senses are awakened and their imagination inspired. Leonardo da Vinci is quoted to have said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. This is so eloquently displayed in his masterpiece, The Mona Lisa. What is surprising to many is that the Mona Lisa has no eyebrows or no eyelashes. It was proven that at one point da Vinci had painted those items and then decided to remove them. In 1512, Michelangelo Buonarotti would paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. He was so dissatisfied with being assigned this massive project that he actually wrote a poem about his angst over the project. In the end, the Sistine Chapel would be hailed as his greatest work. Banksy, a renowned graffiti artist, paints in secret. He has created some of the most amazing artwork using existing architectural structures to enhance his work. Here is some of his work on a wall in London. While Banksy has chosen not to disclose to the world who he is, his work sells for millions of dollars. Art heals. Just ask George Brock, a 20th century French artist who once said, art is a wound turned into light. After the murder of George Floyd, national outrage moved people of all colors and ethnicities to the street to share common outrage. Art can be a form of activism, having the ability to move beyond injustice by providing different perspectives and encouraging peace. Across the country, Black Lives Matter murals lined city streets The project managers and volunteers used art as activism to show that when people come together for a common cause, their collective voices are powerful. Art communicates in ways that words cannot. It speaks to the soul and searches for meaning from every beholder. Today, we will meet an accomplished artist whose story is compelling and whose work is inspiring. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Michelle, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Tabernacle Talks. And my guest today is Vonda Smith. Hey, Vonda, how are you? Hello, everyone. I'm great. How are you? It is so great to see you, Vonda. And, you know, you're kicking off our Meet the Artist series, and you just have some phenomenal work. And I know you're pretty shy about it, but, you know, we're just going to blow you up because your work is amazing. Uh, I guess probably the obvious question that everybody's going to want to know is why did you decide to become an artist? Well, um, becoming an artist wasn't necessarily my idea. I guess it basically predates back to kindergarten. Um, and it's threefold in my answer. Um, I used to paint and scribble and draw and color on every single thing I could get my hands on in kindergarten. And when I graduated, the teacher gave me a giant tablet and a pencil and my parents were just floored. They were like, oh my gosh, you know, like, and then the teacher actually told my mother about it. But then secondly, my mother would buy uh, paint by numbers books and you would basically, they would be at the grocery checkout and you would wet the little palette and dab the brush in it and paint by numbers. And I became obsessed with that where most kids wanted um, toys or candy, I could not get enough paint by numbers books. And then lastly, in high school, I took an art elective and just like, you know, everybody has to take art 101 in my sophomore year. And my teacher, Miss Collins, she said, oh my God, you are amazing. She's like, I really think you should pursue a career in this. And I said, no, no, I, I want to go into accounting is where I was going. 
And she said, no, she said, I really think you should do this. She's like, you're very talented. And I applied to Xavier and got a full art scholarship. So I attribute that to her basically to all three. Wow. So, so what lessons have you learned as an artist? Cause I'm sure we've got tons of artists in our audience. What have you learned? So as an artist, um, I try to remain true to my craft. Um, I've learned that people like original art and they want affordable art. Um, that's been my mantra with selling my pieces. And quite frankly, I've given away a lot of pieces over the years. And at some point I reached a price point and I said, you know what, people are buying. So I need to stop giving it away. Um, and basically, if someone has $1,000 to spend, I think they'd rather have something no one else has, and they're more likely to buy their pieces. Um, the other lesson that I've learned is that you have to listen to your clients. I do mostly commission pieces, and so people sometimes know what they like, but they don't know always how to convey that to me. So we go through a consultation and, and we talk about what their needs are, their size, what their color schemes are. And then I come up with, that's where I come. Well, you know, I had to do some research in order to be able to do, uh, do this interview justice. Uh, how do you choose your palette? So because I work in commissions, um, the client will generally choose the color palette if I'm doing a commission piece. So if something needs to match the decor or an office setting, um, basically I'll paint to their specifications. Um, and then if I'm just feeling like painting a bunch of stuff, I'm always gonna use bright, vibrant, bold colors. And I also um, do a lot of watercolors. So those hues tend to be bright, but sometimes soft and gentle. Well, you have inspired me greatly with your work and so much so you're going to share some of your work with us and we're going to put this up on the screen so the audience can see just how magnificent your work is. And the first piece that we're going to be looking at is called Color Lines. And can you tell me the inspiration behind this piece? This piece dates back to 04, and I think I was a little bit ahead of my time um, with everything that's going on in the world. Um, but Color Lines depicts the association of um, race. Life is very diverse. We have to interact with different people of all races and creeds and colors. Um, and no one race can exist by itself. So that was the inspiration for that piece. And if you look at it, everything is intertwined and overlapping. And this was 2004? Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the larger pieces that I've done. Um, it's, it's pretty big. It's uh, about five by six, I think, or five, four by five. So how long would it take you to do something like this? That, I'm, my spouse is always amazed by, <laughs> I can knock something out in a day. Sometimes it may take months. It just... It just depends on the time that I have. I mean, I do work full time in my regular job. And so um, usually nights and weekends is when I get a chance to paint. So growing up in New Orleans, you know, the oak trees and the moss in the South is pretty much everywhere you go. And I used to as a kid, climb some of those trees and think about, oh my God, they're so beautiful and how the branches would hug you when you sit there, you could sit there for hours and read or daydream. And then as a, I became an adult, I started learning more about those trees and I wasn't liking what I was learning because God created something that's so beautiful and magical and man uses it for barbarities, um, for lynching basically. So you know, as I begin to read and, and explore um, lynchings, you know, I learned over the years that almost 5,000 people were lynched between 1882 and 1968, and nearly over half of those people were Black. And so 
this piece, I haven't made it there yet, but I definitely want to donate it to the lynching museum. Um, I feel like that's its rightful place. It was initially created for the NAACP along with two other pieces, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, that I Have a Dream speech and Rosa Parks um, jail photo, which I had never seen before either. You know, we didn't learn about that in school. We learned about her being on the bus, but they never showed the photo. And so I recently stole those two pieces, but they were all created for the NAACP's um, 100th birthday celebration. And I was invited to bring the pieces along with another colleague. And after we explored um, the cost for shipping, they basically said they couldn't afford it. So it was their loss in some ways, but the pieces remain in my collection. And I think the rightful home for that would be the Lynch Museum. Amazing, amazing piece. Okay. Fritillaria in full bloom. Yes. So I am a flowers fan. Like uh, Georgia O'Keeffe has inspired me in a lot of ways, but I basically love flowers. I'm one of those people, I feel like you give people their flowers while they're living <laughs> versus, you know, after they've gone on. But this piece, um, when I started, I was captivated by it because it was just so different from anything I'd ever seen. And um, I think I originally saw it in a magazine and I, like any other artist, I always tear out pictures of things. And so I said, well, I'm going to keep this for down the road. And then I went to research it and I found out this, this flower, even though it's beautiful, it's hard on the nose. Like it's, it's bell shape emits a pungent odor that's rather disgusting as it blooms. And so you wouldn't know that just by looking at it. But after doing my homework, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Wow. <laughs> okay. This, this last one, this, this one tells a lot of story. Now I'm going to make sure I don't butcher the name here. Jim, New Orleans. New Orleans, yes. So this was my latest commission. Um, the, the client wanted a piece that encapsulated New Orleans. She loved the food and some of the culture. And she's like me, remembered riding the streetcar as a kid. And so if you see that, you'll see beignets in there and crawfish. And she said, well, my brother played the tuba. Can you put some jazz instruments in there? And I said, well, I sure can, you know? And we recently had a sorority reunion and had a chef cook for us. And she made um, these amazing oysters. She said, well, can you add those oysters in there? And I was like, well, I can do whatever you want. So that's where this, this piece is all about New Orleans, the culture, the food, and the people, basically, and the traditions. So, and in French, Jamé means I love. I love this I piece. Love. And anybody that's been to New Orleans can relate to this piece. It, it is soulful too. Very soulful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You know what? That piece next to you. <laughs> I want to talk uh -huh. about the piece that we can see right there. Okay. Next uh -huh. to you. Do you. I'd like to hear more about that. The Billy Holiday. Yes, Billy Holiday. So whenever I can get my kids together, we try to watch, you know, movies and what family movie night and we watch the new um, Billy Holiday movie together. And it was just so deep. And I'm one of those people, I feel like when things touch me, I got to go paint it. So <laughs> this piece came about and I was like, she was, her voice and everything was so beautiful, beautiful, but her life was just so tragic and, and, and blue. And so it came to me to do a monochromatic piece, meaning uh, one color. Um, so Billy is gonna be painted in blue. Everything about this piece is gonna be in shades of blue. So, um, wow, it came about. That's and I already have somebody that said, if you finish this, I want it. So that's kind of where I am now. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, when I first saw it, I was like, wow, Billy Holiday. That's an amazing piece. So how do you explain your art to others? I mean, you've done certainly a, an excellent job of just explaining the inspiration. Do you feel that when people are interested in buying art, they want to know the story so they can tell it? Yes. So when people ask me, I generally will tell them that I'm a versatile painter. Um, 
I can paint pretty much any genre and my style is always vibrant and bold with layers and textures and I use acrylic paints. So they're, they're not, um, they're quicker to dry and you can layer them without having to wait for oils, which take much longer to um, dry. But I also enjoy, like I said, watercolors, but I'm pretty versatile when it comes to subject matter. So where do you find your materials? Because I use a lot of textures in my pieces, I become a bargain shopper. I might go to Tuesday morning or Michael's or any arts and crafts store for those kinds of things. But I'm one that I believe in quality is when it comes to my canvas and my paint. So I use a gallery wrap canvas, which means it's, it's already primed for me. I don't have to do anything. Years ago, I used to build my canvases. So I would buy the canvas, buy the frame, drill it, nail it, pull it, stretch it. And now the technology is caught up, you know, so you can buy it already gallery ready. Um, so that's now I'm looking behind you and I see tools of the trade. Are there some signature tools or favorite tools that you use to do your work? I prefer well-made paintbrushes um, because when you use a cheaper brush, basically the bristles come out and that changes the flow of what of your stroke. I also um, look for genuine embellishments, like there are pieces that might have glass shards in it or 18 karat gold leaf or glass beading. Um, Sometimes I'll use sponges. I recently sold a piece where I used sponges to create coral. And then I've used leaves from the yard to make a school of fish. So it's all about creativity. Nature sometimes plays a role and then the art stores and craft stores will play a role in the pieces. Because I, I personally want you to be able to touch it. That, that whole taboo about, oh, art is only supposed to be looked at. But when you purchase my pieces, you're going to want to touch it because you're going to want to figure out, well, wow, how did she do that? So, but it's all, you know, it's all. <laughs> wow. It, it's an experience and you, you just, you mm -hmm. actually can feel the emotion. It just, your work, the emotion just comes out and touches you. So how do you, how do you sign your art? Do you have like a, a code well, name? I kind of thought my first name was unique. So I do sign my first and my last name and I usually put the year, um, but I also have learned um, to sign the back of the canvas frame. So on the back, you will have my name, the title and the measurements. So if ever you, you know, want to move the piece to a different space, you could say, well, okay, well, it's two by four. You know, now I know it'll fit in that space. You don't have to guess. And that's a little trick I learned from being an art historian over the years um, for a big dealer. Always sign the front and the back. Now, your work is your own, and mm -hmm. it's your vision of how the work should be. So mm -hmm. how do you handle a critique or a criticism if someone had another vision, but it's your mm -hmm. piece? Mm -hmm. So years ago, when I first started, I would um, I would do multiple paintings for clients on a smaller scale, like on on that board, and then they would pick the 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 piece that they wanted, and I would do my best to recreate it in a larger size. I've gotten a little stubborn about my work now in this regard. Um, I remember going to different galleries, trying to get in and, and talking to owners. And I had an owner tell me, you know, um, you're too versatile. You need to just paint trees. And I said, oh, I didn't know how to take that at first. And then I got angry because I was like, you know what? God has given me the gift of sight. And as an artist, I see so much that the average person doesn't even pay attention to. And that would just stifle my creativity to just paint one thing. So that's how I'm stubborn. But when I'm working with clients, like I said, I do my best to listen to what they want. And now we have this whole digital age where I can create a painting on canvas. And if you say, Vonda, you know, I really want to incorporate um, 
seashells in there, well, then I can go grab a picture of a seashell and add that in and crop it and change it. So it gives you a little more creativity with choosing how you want your piece to look. So I admire what you said about just remaining true to yourself in your work. And I guess early on you thought, okay, if I want to be part of the mainstream, I'll just paint what sells. But mm -hmm. I think you're finding that being true to yourself sells. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, what inspires you? I mean, you said you could be watching television with your family mm -hmm. and you think I got to paint this. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you find that it's a lot of your work is impromptu like that? It used to be, and you know, now I'm just, I'll give you an example. Um, back here behind me, I don't know if you can see on this little panel, I have some pictures that I've done pieces of, and I started working on a George Floyd piece. And I got so upset that I had to put it down. So at the time I was really inspired. But the more I started researching and thinking about it and looking at the piece, I think I got a quarter of the way in and I said, you know what, we're going to let this one go for now and I'll come back to it. Um, it was just so, so raw, you know, from watching it over and over in the media. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think I just have to be true to me. You know, I, I know some artists will um, make concessions with their work and just do mass appeal. And I feel like the buyer loses out in some ways because not that it's not original, but when you do a mass production, it loses its value because the more you produce, the less value it has. That makes sense. Wow. So, so how can people in the audience purchase your prints? You'll be able to purchase my paintings at artjockey.com or at artjockey1504 um, at comcast.net. And then, or you can call me. Everything's up on my website. You can contact me. You can email me. And if you don't see something online, I'm always available to create it. <laughs> Vonda, you are an amazing artist. And I always give my guests the last word. If there's some aspiring artist or a student that's sitting out there and they're watching this and they're looking at your work and they're just floored like I am because I was in awe when I first saw your work. You are an amazing, talented artist and the level of sophistication, but they're just fun and moving pieces is beyond anything that I've seen. Uh, what would you tell that aspiring artist that's watching you now? Well, my main advice would be stay true to you. Do what you know how to do best and make it your best. Um, there are going to be people that tell you you can't do it, don't do it. But I've met some young artists in art stores and they're like, thank you for telling me that. Because art is a hard craft to break into and you just have to remain true to what you want to do and it will happen. It will happen. Thank you, Vonda. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> this was so much fun.